Imagine while arriving home and parking in your driveway, you hear shouting next door. You look over and see your widowed neighbor standing on her porch and her daughter yelling at her. Is this elder abuse? And if so, what can you do? Welcome to session one of Combating Elder Abuse and Building Resilience. Throughout this five part series, we'll discuss strategies that help you identify, address and prevent elder abuse. We'll look at ways to advocate for yourself and identify techniques to enhance personal resilience. I'm Jane Barnett. I'm an organizational development co consultant who specializes in adult learning. I'm working with Ask Anonia Senior Center to bring you this five part series. In each session, we'll look at a specific topic focused on mistreatment of elders and resilience. The key topics we're gonna to cover starting with session one is defining elder abuse. What is it? What forms does it take? What are indications that you should watch for? In session two, we're gonna look at prevention, how to recognize, address, and prevent abuse. Tracy Reinard, an elder law specialist from Devery Smith Frank will join us on session three, and she's gonna talk about wills, estates, and power of attorney. In sessions four and five, we'll focus on building resilience and enhancing advocacy for self. Let's get session one started with this text. That's an example of something I received on my phone that was sent by a friend or whom I thought was a friend and that I almost responded to. So she was in a hurry. I thought she was traveling. In fact, I knew she was traveling. So I just assumed that the spelling errors were reflective of that. This is pretty typical of the type of text you're gonna receive from a scammer. And if you notice the three game cards that are gift cards that I've noted on this slide, this is also very typical of what a scammer is going to ask for. There's a code on the back of these cards. And when you share that with someone over the phone or by email, that money is gone. You can't recover it and you certainly can't trace it. Phone scams, on the other hand, start more like this. You may get someone calling saying they're from your credit card company and that there's been unusual activity on your card. You may have a representative who says they're calling from the Canadian Revenue Agency and that there are overdue taxes owing. You may even during COVID get a call from someone saying for 30 or $50, they'll move you to the front of the line for your second COVID shot. If it's your computer that you're getting a call about, they may say, we've noticed a virus on your laptop. If you give us your password, I'll fix it for you. Senior abuse takes a variety of forms. The text and phone examples I've shared with you are just a few of the ways that scammers try to take advantage of seniors or any of us who have a laptop, a computer, a phone. And what they're doing is they're trying to access our personal and financial information. Let's go back to the example I gave at the beginning of this session. You're parking in your driveway and you hear your neighbor's daughter yelling at her. This is an example of emotional abuse. So I'm using language like elder abuse and senior abuse. How would you define elder abuse? What are some words that you would use? The World Health Organization defines senior abuse as a single or repeated act or lack of appropriate action that occurs in a relationship where there's an expectation of trust and it can cause harm or distress to an older person. Here's a simpler definition, which I prefer to use because I think it's more, um, it's easier to remember and it's a quick one that can, you can use as a prompt. Actions or inactions that jeopardize the health and well-being of an older person. And when I say older person, elders, older adults, I'm referring to individuals 65 years of age and up. 
What does a senior who's experiencing mistreatment look like to you? You know, in our minds, we might have a picture and we might have words that go with that. Things like weak, timid, frail. We may think of deteriorating health as an indicator. Abuse can happen to any senior, regardless of culture, gender, race, or financial status. Most seniors are mentally competent. They're able to make decisions for themselves and they don't require constant care. They're completely responsible for their own health needs. But where abuse occurs, the senior may be dependent upon the person to remain in their own home or to live independently. And that means that they're often isolated from friends, family, or neighbors. This is a typical practice of someone who is mistreating or abusing a senior. That isolation prevents others from being able to check in. There may be cognitive impairment, deteriorating health, personal or financial problems, and or addiction. These can all be factors when elder abuse is involved. When we think of an abuser, we may think of a faceless, nameless stranger. But research shows that in most cases, family members are involved, particularly adult sons and daughters, spouses, or grandchildren. There are others who are involved with um, seniors by virtue of providing care or services who may also mistreat or abuse a senior. These are people like neighbors, caregivers, salespeople, healthcare providers. Molly Hofer, a family life educator at the University of Illinois, notes that abusers often exhibit specific traits. They tend to verbally abuse and insult or blame the older person and they may express indifference or anger toward the senior. They often are overly concerned with the senior's financial situation versus their health and well-being. They may have issues with alcohol and or drugs. Very typically, they prevent the senior from speaking for themselves or even being alone by themselves. And so they may socially isolate the senior. And this has been a real issue during COVID. Abuse is about power and control within a relationship where there is an expectation of trust and where the senior is dependent upon a person. And that trust also comes with authority. There are several recognized forms of abuse. I'm gonna give you a couple of seconds See if you can come up with a few of them yourself. So these seven types of elder abuse are well documented and researched. And I'm going to share each of them with you more specifically along with examples. But before I do that, I'd like you to point to the type of abuse you think is most common for seniors. If you picked financial, you're absolutely right. And due to the pandemic, it's being followed very closely by emotional abuse. So let's look at each type more closely. Physical abuse is an act of violence or rough handling. It can cause physical discomfort, pain, or injury for a senior. During COVID, this has been particularly difficult to identify due to social distancing and isolation. Seniors may even find themselves during this time living with the abuser and being unable to leave the home or find a safe space in their home. Let me give you an example of what this might look like. During line dancing with Askinonia and on a Zoom call, you see your friend's wrists and arms are covered in bruises. You know that her son moved back with her to live with her during the pandemic. And when you ask her about her home situation, she becomes very withdrawn and very anxious. 
Emotional abuse refers to actions or words that cause feelings of distress, loss of self-worth, dignity, and identity. This may include someone isolating a senior and making decisions on their behalf, limiting or removing phone or technology access, and limiting health care availability. Here's an example. You're having a weekly Zoom call with your friend and her husband's in the background cursing and telling her to get off the computer. You offer to set up a distance, a distantly safe visit, but her husband refuses to allow her to participate. Financial abuse is the theft or misuse of money, power of attorney, property, or possessions with or without the consent of the senior. Examples might include family or adult children who move back home but don't contribute financially. Preventing the senior from accessing their bank or accounts or someone who's misusing power of attorney and forging checks. Let me give you an example. Your friend says to you, I'm self-isolating and my son-in-law has offered to do my banking for me since my daughter works shifts. He asked for my PIN number, saying it's easier for him to deposit my checks that way. When I ask him to withdraw funds, I notice my monthly statements sometimes reflect a greater or larger withdrawal than I actually requested. Neglect is the intentional or unintentional failure to provide care and assistance necessary for a senior's health, safety, and well-being. When an individual can't or chooses not to provide important aspects of an elder's care, things that could include canceling doctor's appointments or online consultations, not providing groceries and medication on a regular basis, or not checking in on the senior when knowing that they live by themselves. Let me give you an example. My friend and I have lived together for 10 years. My knees are bad lately and I've not been able to contribute to food preparation or cleaning the house. She's really angry with me and she refuses to clean my side of the house or prepare food for me. She hasn't talked to me in a week. I have no one else to talk to because English is not my first language. Sexual abuse is any sexual behavior directed towards a senior without their full knowledge or consent. Let me give you an example. My husband died last year and during COVID, our neighbor has offered to pick up my groceries and packages in town for me. When he drops them off, he hugs and kisses me and he says that's his tip, but it makes me feel really uncomfortable. Spiritual abuse occurs when a senior is prevented from practicing their faith or spirituality or involves forcing them to participate in a spiritual ritual or practice that is not of their choice. Here's an example. My daughter-in-law doesn't support my spiritual traditions and has convinced my son not to let my grandchildren come to the powwows with me anymore. Institutional abuse is represented by neglect and poor care within an institution or specific care setting, like a hospital or a clinic. Here's an example. I visited mom at her long-term care setting and I noticed that she's been wearing the same outfit for the last three visits and her bed linens are soiled. When I asked the care provider about some information about mom, they say they're too busy and they'll have to get back to me later. Not all situations reflect intentional abuse. Let me give you an example of what I mean. A senior couple visits a medical clinic where the doctor notices sores and cuts on the wife's mouth. After asking a few questions, she learns that the wife has Alzheimer's and is refusing to eat. The husband is concerned for his wife's health 
and he has been force feeding her. This is not about intentional abuse. It's about education and awareness. So this gives the doctor an opportunity to provide some other options for nutrition and to provide education. What would indicate to you that a family member or a friend is experiencing abuse? What should you look for? Well, some indications are pretty clear that bring up red flags, changes in behavior. For example, your neighbor has always been outgoing and ready to participate in everything. And they suddenly become very anxious and withdrawn and they aren't very communicative with you anymore. This could be an indication that something is going on. Changes in day-to-day -day behavior or routines. For example, you know that your other neighbor usually gets up in the morning and goes out in gardens or gets a walk underway right away. And all of a sudden you haven't seen them. You know that someone else is living with them, but they aren't doing the things that you know that they love to do and they haven't been visible for a few days. Unexplained physical injuries like bruises, scratches, or sprains. Dehydration and poor nutrition. For example, you have your mom's groceries delivered to her on a weekly basis, but when you visit midweek, you notice most of the groceries have been used up and there's hardly anything left in the cupboard. Improper use of medication. For example, you order your dad's heart medication on a bi-weekly basis. But when you visit your dad, you notice that most of the medication is already gone in the first week. Poor hygiene, rashes, bed sores, and lack of cleanliness can also be an indication of abuse particularly where you know someone has taken great pride in their personal appearance and in their home, and suddenly those things begin to change. A sudden drop in cash flow or financial holdings. For example, you go out with your friend, she usually has a bit of cash in her wallet, and you notice that not only the cash is missing, but a lot of her charge cards as well. Now, warning signs don't automatically mean that abuse is taking place. So it's important to ask questions if you're concerned and seek advice from abuse experts. And later in this slide series, you'll be provided with information about email and phone numbers for abuse experts. And they're also listed in the informatic that you can print off. Ariel Zwang, who is the CEO of Safe Horizon, the largest nonprofit victim services organization in the United States, notes that there are three key indicators of senior abuse. If the senior doesn't seem to have the freedom to go where and when they want, if they have to account for every dollar and every place they go, and if they are separated from loving relationships that you know used to be important to them, these are key signs that abuse or mistreatment may be taking place. Senior abuse is rarely reported. Why do you think that is? If fear was one of your responses, you're absolutely right. And there are a number of aspects to fear. Fear of retaliation, fear of not being believed, particularly if the abuser is well-liked and respected in the community. Guilt or shame. If this is an adult son or daughter, you may think this is not how I raised my kids and I'm embarrassed about the way that they're treating me. You may also be fearful of losing your independence. For example, if you call the police on the abuser and they're removed from your home, you may not be able to live independently. And so there's a fear of being institutionalized. This may be a pattern of behavior in a, in a family. So it's, it's cultural, it's normalized, and people don't think of it as abuse. There may be a feeling that nothing can be done. If I make this phone call, nothing's going to change. And therefore I don't trust the law system and I don't trust the police. So people may hesitate to report for those reasons, or they may not even be aware of the services that are available for seniors related to 
abuse and mistreatment. Others who may observe the abuse may be fearful of making a report because they don't wanna make the situation worse for the senior. They may also be afraid of retaliation on the part of the abuser towards them. And they're afraid that they may get sued or they may get called to testify. But there are lots of people in your community who can be helpful when mistreatment or abuse is taking place. Doctors, nurses, lawyers, social workers, and community services are all places and people who can provide objective, respectful, and non-judgmental information about resources available to seniors. And in worst case scenario, the police can be involved. This is the phone line and email listing that I mentioned to you earlier in this session. These are groups that specialize in elder abuse and abuse prevention and they have a number of resources online and they have people that are available 24 hours a day to answer calls when there is concern for seniors. Today we looked at the definition of senior abuse and ways to recognize it. In session two, we'll talk about prevention strategies. What we can do if we're experiencing abuse or see others whom we think are being mistreated. Thanks for joining me. I'll see you next time.